Wow, what a crowd. <laughs> That's great. Well, welcome to University Lutheran and Town Hall. Uh, thank you all for coming out tonight, um, especially since, you know, it's World Series night. So. <laughs> and uh, we're going to have a conversation here, Skip and I. Yeah. So go ahead. Yeah, well, uh, David and I have some common interests in, uh, in, in the topic of uh, this book, and, uh, I've, which I have read and I uh, recommend to you. <clears throat> I think this is a really important book for understanding uh, politics of this country and the current state of affairs, but I want to I wanna go back just a little bit here and ask Dave how he got into writing about you know, laboring in this particular vineyard. <laughs> how, did you, how did you start writing about the far right and hate groups? Um, it actually goes back to the very start of my career in journalism. Um, I was all of uh, 19 years old when I went to work at the little newspaper in Sandpoint, Idaho, and uh, was named the editor of that paper when I was 20. Um, little, it's just a little daily um, called the Daily Bee. Um, but it's 20 miles north of Hayden Lake, Idaho, and this was in 1978-79 when the Aryan Nations was moving in down there around Hayden Lake. And um, we went through a period where we were trying to assess uh, what to do with these um, racists that were moving in down the road. Uh, they obviously wanted a lot of publicity and, and we were very reluctant to give it to them. Um, I used to actually get letters to the editor from a guy named Robert Matthews, uh, who uh, would, his letters were very memorable because they were always in all caps, and they were all you know, riddled with uh, anti-Semitic garbage. And I actually called him up once, and he lived in Medellin Falls, which is over in northeast Washington, and uh, called him up to explain to him why we weren't running his letters, but... <clears throat> He never did figure that one out. Um, and within a couple of years, uh, I was no longer at the Daily Bee by then. I had moved on to other papers down in southern Idaho. But uh, within a couple of years, all of the panhandle was really awash in this wave of hate crimes, uh, attacks on uh, minority businesses, Jewish businesses, uh, uh, mixed race families uh, were being assaulted. And in fact, Idaho was one of the very first states to pass a hate crimes law because of this wave of um, hatefulness activity that was uh, really rising there in, in the panhandle. And it culminated in 1984 with the rampage of the order, which was led by my friend Robert Matthews. <laughs> um, Robbie, was, uh, there, was, there were about 12 of these guys in the order, and they committed about 24, 25 uh, bank and armored car robberies, and they also uh, committed the assassination of a radio talk show host in Denver named Ellen Berg, who had the audacity to attack them on air. Uh, Robbie was cornered by the FBI up here on Whidbey Island on December 7th, 1984, and uh, refused to come out, and they lobbed a flare into the house, and it burned down around him, and that was the end of the order. Um, but a lot of, the, but the legacy still le uh, lingers on, partly because um, uh, they actually, uh, the skinheads and racists actually go out to Whidbey Island once a year on the anniversary of his death and held a memorial gathering out there. And uh, more importantly, one of the other members of the uh, of the order, the gang, was uh, a guy named David Lane, who uh, wrote prodigiously in prison, all these racist screeds, and one of them was, became known as uh, the, uh, the 14 words, which is the, the, what you now hear uh, racists or skinheads and neo-Nazis use all the time. The 14 words are, we must secure a future for our, uh, for our children and for white people. Um, and this is this is a kind of online. It's sort of a Nazi, yeah, yeah. You know, Nazi signature, you'll, which is to say, fourteen eighty eight. You'll call the, you'll hear them call themselves the fourteen eighty eighters. They're referring to the fourteen words, and eighty eight is uh, it's a syllogism for Heil Hitler. That's the eight eight. 
eighth uh, letter of the alphabet. Eighth letter of the alphabet. So, uh, and this is something that's very common in the alt right. But well, anyway, so uh, yeah, and I didn't I, I didn't do anything until the nineties. So. Well, you know, it's it's the interesting thing because uh, people people are often surprised that there were ne neo Nazis in the Pacific Northwest. <laughs> and I remember when I was editing East Side Week, I got a letter from a reader. And we had been writing about what was going on in Idaho. This would be in the early 90s. And she, she said, you know, I just, I don't understand how in a place as wonderful and, and, and green and whatnot as the Pacific Northwest, we could have such a thing as, as uh, Nazis. And, uh, but in fact, when you look at the history of this region, it's not surprising at all. And, and uh, it's something both you, you and I have done. So. You know, you had these kind of outlaw uh, guys in, in the in the 80s with Robert Matthews, the Order, and and then it morphed into something else, right? Yeah, it well, it morphed into the uh, Patriot Militia Movement in the 1990s, and um, it was very, really, what a, what Patriot Militia Movement represented was uh, white supremacism's attempt, first real attempt to sort of mainstream itself mostly by uh, stripping out its overtly racist and anti-Semitic elements so they weren't obvious and they weren't clear. And this enabled them to present themselves as, as being just concerned about the Constitution and the flag and, and uh, patriotic love of America and that sort of thing, which is what they do. And, you know, and this actually goes back. Um, Knut did some really great work uh, in the last few years on um, the old clan in the Northwest uh, and how, how the Northwest has actually been host to these really racist elements for years and years and years going back even to the Civil War but uh, more particularly to the <clears throat> early 20th century. And the funny thing is there wasn't a lot of difference in the sort of, uh, I mean, when I com would compare the stuff that was going on in the 90s when I'd go to militia meetings, it was very similar, very similar to the sort of rhetoric that was common in the Klan and the silver shirts in the 1920s and 30s. Well, yeah, that, that, that's one of the things that, that really stuck, struck me was uh, uh, the silver shirt movement, which was national, and there was this, the answer to the black shirts and the brown shirts. It was the American fascist, the Silver Legion, national movement. In 1936, William Dudley Pelly, the head silver shirt, uh, who had dubbed himself the America's Hitler, and you know, went around with a Sam Brown belt and the, the boots and everything. Yeah. And, uh, <clears throat> and uh, he found uh, Washington State, and the Pacific Northwest in general, but certainly Washington State, very fertile grounds for recruiting. And in fact, he, he headed his 1936 presidential campaign here in Washington State. We were the only state that put him on the ballot. And That's so, right. So he, he moved <laughs> here and, and, uh, and this was, uh, you know, overtly Nazi. I mean, this was, yeah. late, he started in the late 20s, but by the time he was here, Hitler was in power and that kind of thing. And that's one of the things that struck me in reading your book and in, in things that we've talked about is the, the tactics of William Dudley Pelley, the anti-Semitism, the militarism, the uh, fabricating of complaints against the legitimacy of the president. They believed, the Silver Shirts believed that, uh, that Warren G. Harding had been murdered, that, uh, that uh, Herbert Hoover was not a citizen. There was a whole birther thing about Her that's Herbert right. Hoover. Conspiracy theories are not a new thing. Uh, and, and that Franklin Roosevelt was actually uh, a Jewish man named Rosenfeld. Rose right, Rosen right, right. Yeah, Rosenfeld. <laughs> um, <clears throat> anyway, I, I bring that up because y you mentioned the, the parallels. And one of the things that you talk about in the book that I think is really important is this idea that these movements have to create a kind of false universe for their followers. And we hear a lot about fake news and we hear a lot about um, uh, conspiracy theories. But I wonder if you could talk about what is the, what is the world these folks are, are, are living in or designing for themselves? Sure. Well, and, and I call it Alt-America because it's like an alternative universe. And, and I first observed this in the 90s when I was reporting on the Patriot Militia Movement that I, I, 
they actually would create this uni alternative universe for themselves and for their followers to dwell in that sort of was parallel to ours, but their worldview was totally different because they didn't really believe in the usual, what it, basically the foundations of what's factual, what's true, and what's not. Um, they, be by believing in all of these conspiracy theories, they essentially throw all the rules of logic and reason and factuality and evidence right out the window um, and instead replace it with um, innuendo and wild speculation. Uh, and that's how it works. So um, in that alternative universe, now in the 1990s, uh, this alternative universe primarily consisted of believing in the New World Order, uh, black helicopters, we're going to be coming in and taking people away, rounding them up into concentration camps. Uh, FEMA camps actually got their start with John Trockman in the 1990s. And um, it, it, actually, this is how Alex Jones got his start, was in 1995 as a conspiracy theorist working in the fields of promoting patriot militia theories. And that's, it, but, it, you know, the, of course, as you can see, the from following it, the, the alternative universe eventually took on all kinds of different components. Once we reached like 9-11, uh, it became really developed a really wildly own universe, which was um, all these 9-11 truth or 9-11 truth conspiracy theories, so on and so forth. Prior to that, it had been primarily stuff that came out of the old posse commentatus movement including, yeah, the, the belief that the Constitution doesn't really allow for a federal government, doesn't allow the federal government to own land, that the sheriff is the highest uh, law enforcement officer in the land, county sheriff. And we have seen all these beliefs still filtering through to this day because they were uh, really fueled the, the standoff at the Malheur National Wildlife Refuge and um, the Bundy Ranch standoff as well. Uh, but they're also really very much a uh, standard part of the belief system of the Patriot Militia Movement now, which I, I, I hate to tell you this, it's incredibly widespread in rural America. I mean, it's, it's everywhere and in every region of the country, so. Well, I was gonna ask you, what, what, how would you, just give us some broad categories because mm -hmm. Today, sort of, it's it's uh, there's a tendency. I mean, you have the far right, the extreme mm -hmm. right, the paleo yes, yeah. right, the conservative right. And where where are people on this spectrum? I mean, Pat Buchanan, for example, he's been around a long time. We're not surprised about his politics, and and he would be considered somewhat mainstream. I think he certainly has been treated that way over the years. Yeah, in although the media. we de I definitely categorize him as a white nationalist mm -hmm. in the book. Um, it, there are a lot of components to the radical right. The reason I kind of use the, um, uh, the umbrella of Alt America is that because they all share this alternative universe, or at least various versions of it. They, um, you know, they, <clears throat> they all listen to Alex Jones. They all believe in a variety of conspiracy theories, but they have, but ideologically, they come from a lot of different backgrounds. Um, so the main radical right component that, uh, or the section of the radical right that a lot of the book focuses on is the Patriot Militia Movement because it was kind of the wellspring of this whole alternative universe. But by 2008 or 2009, we were seeing a lot of other radical right elements coming into play that were not part of the Patriot Militia Movement. And these were the, particularly the white nationalists, white supremacists, and um, some, some very serious nativists as well. Well, is so, this, was this a response to the election of Barack Obama? Yeah, yeah, that was primarily when, what we really saw was that after Obama's election, um, the Tea Party phenomenon became a massive conduit for mainstreaming uh, patriot militia belief system. The Republican Party and most of mainstream Republicans had really resisted the sort of conspiracist worldview for most of 
that first decade, mainly because they were, you know, 9-11 truth or the conspiracy theories and, and the main villain of these theories was George W. Bush. So yeah, Republicans were anything but enthusiastic uh, when it came to these conspiracy theories uh, for during Bush's years. But when once Obama was elected and we started getting a whole panoply of conspiracy theories um, about him, you know, that he was gonna take away guns, uh, that he was secretly a communist and that he was actually raised by radicals um, and um, that he was not a, an American citizen and that his, he had faked his birth certificate. Um, and those all became, you know, part of that, uh, uh, really that whole Tea Party movement. But the Tea Party movement within a few years, or really within a matter of months, was just flooded with uh, all of these uh, militia figures that we saw. And probably the most prominent of them, the best example I can give you of this is the Oath Keepers, uh, which became very much a, a Tea Party affiliated uh, organization, um, is overtly a Patriot militia uh, organization. Um, and they actually go out and try to uh, recruit members of the military and law enforcement to uh, radicalize them or to bring them into this extremist belief system. Uh, so, so what was the what was the impetus for this book? Well, I, I really wanted to write a book about humpback whales. <laughs> <laughs> that was what was my plan for the last two years, um, but. When we saw, when, when Trump came along, um, it was very worrisome. I saw, because I knew from his 2011 run that he had really managed to gain some ground by um, uh, pushing the birther conspiracy theory. He was basing his whole campaign on a right-wing conspiracy theory. <coughs> and this was kind of worrisome to me. And so... <laughs> When he elect, or when he announced his, came down that escalator and announced his candidacy, I was watching very carefully um, because it was cause for concern. And sure enough, right there that first day, first announcement, he came out and, and, and bashed Mexicans, called them criminals and rapists and things like that. And, um, and that was concerning, but what we really, I mean, the, the main reason I, became concerned and realized I needed to write a book about it was that right along with his candidacy, we suddenly saw all this energy, uh, this organizing energy and recruitment and really spread into social media of all these right-wing radical groups, and particularly the alt-right, which was a new phenomenon. So what is it about Trump that you think is re resonating in general, but also resonating with this particular constituency? Is it simply that he is kind of not dog whistling, but actually speaking to some of their very specific beliefs and concerns? Or is it, uh, is it charisma? Is it, wh sure. wh what is it? Well, some of it is that, and I have a little slideshow that I'll uh, give at the end of our conversation okay. uh, that hopefully will kind of illustrate this. Um, but the first thing is, I mean, he, he is an authoritarian. I mean, he's an authoritarian figure. He's a classic authoritarian leader, and he's appealing to people on the basis of his authoritarianism. And people need to understand that, that authoritarianism is only partly a phenomenon of the leaders. You know, we always focus on these leaders and think of authoritarianism in those terms. But really authoritarianism is much more about the armies of followers who raise them to power. And because these, are, these folks have very specific personality traits and um, very specific personality profiles. And right-wing authoritarians are what they call them. And they have you know, three different basic clusters of traits. One is authoritarian aggression, which is to um, be aggressive against anyone who uh, does not uh, submit to the will of the leader. And the other one is authoritarian submission, which is submitting to the legitimate leader. But if they see the leader as not being legitimate, as they did with 
Obama or Bill Clinton or would have with Hillary Clinton, then they're the opposite of authoritarian. They see those people as illegitimate and try to drive them from power and seek to portray them as illegitimate through whatever means they can, including uh, suggesting that they're not real Americans. So that's kind of how that, that whole symbiosis works. So yeah, the, the problem is less the, the actual, <laughs> the people who are, uh, you know, the, Trump himself, and as the thing that concerns me is, you know, this army of followers that he has. Well, I was thinking back, we were talking about the 1930s, and there was the America First, there was the German-American Bund, there were the Silver Shirts, there were, you know, a number of these groups. But they all had kind of competing agendas and never seemed to really go anywhere. And right. part, partly, I think it was because the charismatic leader in America at that time was Franklin Roosevelt. Who was the antithesis, right? Yep. But is is Trump a uniter in that sense? Is he? Oh yeah. Yeah. yeah he's no, the, he's he's, he's, he's the been the, he's been this charismatic figure that all of the. I mean, one of the things that was kind of interesting when I started studying the alt right, really about three years ago, in 2013, 14, when they it started happening. Um, mm. <clears throat> The alt-right is definitely a new phenomenon and it's basically white nationalism rewired for the 21st century uh, and it's designed to, it's not your grandfather's clan, it's very, it's, uh, it's very socially adept it's, uh, and technologically adept and they, uh, are, they use humor and they use social media they use all these memes and these ideas, you know, it's, and it's very much geared towards um, recruiting people 18, ages 18 to 30, white males, almost solely, and it is designed, you know, the, the whole idea of the, behind what they try to recruit them on is these various grievances that young white males may have. And so much of the politics and much of what you see going on in the alt-right is very transgressive. It's design, it's, you know, naughty humor. Let's be as racist as we can. Let's be as, and then when you call them on it, they say, oh, we're just being ironic. <laughs> right? Well, I was going to ask you, speaking of that, I mean, of course, we had at the University of Washington, uh, uh, Milo Yiannopoulos. Yeah. Yeah. You, were, you were at that event. I was and saw some of the things that happened there firsthand. Yeah. And, you know, we're talking about some of these people who are, are um, you know, speaking to this, gen this, this generation of, that you're talking about. Um, tell us a little bit about that event and what you saw, what you witnessed there. Uh -huh. And, and, cause that, that's some real firsthand experience. That was ugly. <laughs> it was just ugly. Um, <clears throat> Yeah, so got there and, uh, you know, it was kind of a, I mean, I've been covered um, uh, protests on Red Square before. So it seemed, it felt like just one of those normal things. But what, what actually happened was they lined all the people who were going to see Milo up outside of uh, the hall where he was speaking and wouldn't let anybody in. And so all these people were in a big long line to get in and they were standing there and all the protesters started coming in and basically surrounding them. And for the most part, you know, 99% of those protesters were nonviolent and peaceful, uh, but were, you know, letting them know that they didn't approve of their alt-right politics. And then the black bloc folks showed up and it started getting violent and I got it several times and, um, and one of the the third time the last time I got hit the, they knocked the camera out from my stick that I was using and it went across the ground and I was standing next to this young tall man who had been acting as a peacekeeper all night and as I got my uh, phone I went and picked it up and uh, turned back and there was that young man laying there on the ground he'd been shot by one of the alt-writers. 
And it took him a couple months to figure out that it was actually the wife. Of, there was this guy that had been watching all night who was going around and clearly trying to cause trouble. And, and uh, um, I was keeping an eye on him, and sure enough, but it wasn't him that actually shot him. He was the guy that got in the tussle with the peacekeeper, and his wife pulled out the gun and shot the peacekeeper. So that was the end of that presentation. And, and yeah, and I've had to cover several of these. I've been down to, I was at that horrible uh, <laughs> show, and I, 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 I'm refraining from cursing. So uh, in Berkeley in April, when, um, when there was another big demonstration there, and then, you know, and that was the one where I first saw the boulder flying over my head. And then I saw an intact brake drum flying over my head. And I, but I, I think I'm going to watch out of it from above. <laughs> it was very traumatic. And it was really ugly. I've got a couple pictures from that that uh, hopefully I'll show you. Um, Do you think but, we're yeah. going to see more violence? Well, um, I, I hope not. I think... Um, People in the anti-fascist movement are starting to understand now that these guys are trolling them, that they're trying to create situations where they just they want the violence because that's what Nazis do. That's what fascists do. They always they always feed on violence, especially at this stage in their development. It's their way of a making their opponents look bad and b making themselves look good. Like so. Um, it's it's a win win for them. So is it okay to punch a Nazi? It's not. As much as I'd like to, you know, R Richard Spencer does have the world's most punchable face, but I don't recommend punching him. <laughs> just because, <laughs> just because uh, it's what they want. Uh, if you, I mean, if you want to help them win, go ahead. Uh, if you want to beat them, we get you. Then you know you have to outsmart them. These guys are smart. They're not stupid. They're not, like I say, they're not your grandparents' clan. And um, they, know, they know what they're doing. They have a very specific strategy in mind. They very much want to use democracy's institutions to turn it against itself. They want to use free speech, the concept of free speech, very cynically as a weapon to turn around and club their opponents with. When in fact they have, they themselves have no respect for the concept of free speech, um, and would be just as happy if their opponents. I mean, part of the problem is that that I've gone to the, these demonstrations, and most of them have been, you know, they have their free speech, and then these thousands and thousands of demonstrators are exercising their free speech, and 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 the only time that gets out of hand is when one of them picks a fight. And a lot of times it's those right wingers who are actually starting the fights. So, you know, and it, co it goes both ways. You know, nobody's innocent in that. But it's, uh, it's a pretty ugly scene. So I'm very concerned. I'm mostly concerned that, um, you know, we have seen a lot of Patriot militiamen showing up at these things and they are carrying arms. Um, so I'm very concerned somebody's going to get shot one of these days. We've already had a couple shootings, and we just had a shooting, attempted shooting down in, in Gainesville, Florida at a Richard Spencer event. Who are the figures uh, that stick out from, from your research that maybe we haven't heard of, but we should be paying attention to? Um, you mentioned Richard Spencer. He's obviously uh, someone we're aware of. Uh, but who who are some of the people that we might not know that are drivers of this? Well, they're actually, believe it or not, right here in Seattle, there's a guy named Greg Johnson who runs one of the most um, powerful uh, house organs of the alt-right movement called Counter Currents. Um, he just moved here about a year ago. Um, but we have learned about him mainly through these undercover reporters who've been going out and showing up at going to these alt-right events. One was a stranger reporter who did a terrific job uh, getting inside them and uh, talking, you know, uncovering about, uh, talking, these guys are talking about how being secret agents at their workplaces, a lot of these guys are tech workers who are working in the tech fields and they're saying, yeah, don't reveal your white nationalist views to your coworkers, but just secretly act like a white nationalist 
by not allowing black people into your teams and, and, and undercutting feminists and so on and so forth, doing all the things that, that the alt-right does. Um, and, and yeah, there, and then there was also the New York Times, you know, the kid from Sweden uh, who went undercover and, and recovered and covered all this stuff. So yeah, Greg Johnson's actually one of the guys that, that we follow. Um, he's one of the newer ones. Another uh, gentleman who's certainly a character in, and in terms of the alt-right itself is really one of its more significant figures because he's uh, attracted this huge following and that's the editor of the Daily Stormer, a uh, young man named Andrew Anglin. Now, you may know that Richard Spencer lives half the year in Whitefish, Montana and he tried to do a, a rally over there in Montana and um, or, or actually his, his mother owns property in Montana and she got crossways with some of the local uh, real estate folks there including a Jewish uh, woman who then was besieged by alt-right trolls on social media and at her home and received all kinds of threats. Um, and these were all sent into, these flying monkeys were all sent into action by Andrew Anglin at the Daily Stormer because he was trying to defend Richard Spencer. And um, the Southern Poverty Law Center, for whom I am the West Coast correspondent, <laughs> decided to, uh, they did what they do well, which is they are taking young Mr. Anglin to court uh, for his uh, inappropriate for the leading the threats against this Jewish woman. And uh, their, um, Anglin is now on the run. He's in hiding because he doesn't want the SPLC to uh, deliver the papers, the court papers to him that would require him. Basically, we're trying to put him out of business, um, and is, which is something the SPLC does quite regularly. And... Um, He's been taking the Daily Storm. Daily Stormer got taken down from its original provider and is now, it's coming out of Albania, I think. Yeah, and he's right. a, a provider in Albania. And it's keeping it up. But there's a, lo a local company that's protecting it. Yeah. A Washington State company that's protecting its free yes. speech from yes. uh, service attacks. Yep, denial of that's right. Attacks. So those are some of the main players. I mean, there's a whole world of them out there, but those are the main, the guys, at least on the alt-right, to be aware of. And then there's also always the Patriot Militia Movement, um, which is really a different segment of the radical right. They, they get, and those folks are, you know, probably the main players in that movement are Stuart Rhodes, the leaders, leader of the Oath Keepers, and Richard Mack, um, who's head of the, an outfit called the Constitutional Sheriffs and Peace Officers Association. And they are, all, they recruit sheriffs and policemen into the constitutionalist belief system. He's very closely associated with the Bundy family. And uh, yeah, and he met with Jeff, Se he and several of his constitutional sheriffs met with Jeff Sessions and, and David uh, Vitter back in December of 2015, so. Uh, well, you mentioned this fellow Johnson that had recently moved to Seattle mm -hmm. and, the, and the sort of uh, tech connections. And, uh, but the, I just, it reminds me that <clears throat> uh, there are several movements in the Northwest that are encouraging all white immigration to the Northwest to create what they call the American Redoubt. Or, <laughs> yeah. uh, I know Harold Covington. Yeah who uh, has uh, the Northwest Front podcast. Yeah, He's a yeah. long-time Nazi. Uh, and and, uh, and uh, an inspiration to Dylan Roof. Right. Dylan Roof read yeah. his... Dylan read Roof his was a fan of Harold Covington's. And, uh, and he's kind of co-opted the, the um, Cascadia flag, yeah. the colors, so everything looks very wholesome and very kind of, you know, green and Cascadian. Uh, but, I, you know, it's many of these folks have identified the, you know, the old Oregon country as, yeah. well, as prime territory. Well, this goes back, as you know. I mean, that was why the Aryan Nations moved out here. 
uh, up here from Southern California in 76 was they wanted to make the Pacific Northwest an all white homeland. Um, that was their plan. And it was actually, the, the plan actually goes, that concept goes back even a decade before that to a guy named Pastor Bob Miles, who was a Klan uh, leader in upstate Michigan near Dearborn. And, uh, and Miles was quite a character, but uh, yeah, he was actually the first one to propose. He wanted to create an all-white homeland, and he looked around the country and he said, well, the best place for it far away is the Pacific Northwest, because they, the, they have the fewest minorities of any part of the country. <laughs> Which was kind of by design. I was yeah. going to say it actually goes back to the 1840s and it 50s does. with the black exclusion laws in Oregon yeah. and, yeah. and the, the efforts to keep this area white and segregated. And, That's right. And, uh, and that legacy has not been gone unnoticed by some folks. Yeah, yeah. And it was clearly part of um, Richard Butler's thinking when he moved the, the Aryan Nations up to Coeur d'Alene or to Hayden Lake. And that was always part of their program, was that they wanted to create this white homeland here in the Northwest. And that is, lives on today with you know, Greg Johnson and Countercurrents and these white nationalists who want to create this white homeland up here. Well, I want to ask you another personal question, which is, um, <clears throat> I know that when I have done research on the history of this stuff, uh, I get in a really bad mood. <laughs> I find it really hard to process and I have to spend a lot of time looking at the trees and the water to kind of regain some sense of sanity. And uh, how do you process this? I mean, you spend, you've spent years in the, in the muck here. Um, it's not easy. It, it actually, yeah. It's, and, and honestly, it's been really hard this past year because... Um, the uh, these events, these rallies that I've been covering have been um, pretty violent, and, and you know, I, I may be getting PTSD from it. I don't know. Um, I I do know that I take I take a couple of weeks to um, breathe after I have to cover them. Uh, one of them, you know, I mean, my previous book was a book about killer whales, and uh, <laughs> that's what I do. <laughs> the orcas I, are the happy stuff, I, right? I go out and, and uh, spend time out in the San Juans and other places and sea kayak, and that's how I get this out of my system. A lot of it, honestly, to tell you the truth, uh, for, you know, the first decade of, you know, previous, you know, the 2001, and forward, um, I was a stay-at-home dad, and I had a little girl to raise. And, and mm -hmm. believe me, that when your daily life is sweet like that, it makes everything easier. So, yeah, yeah that was part of how I survived. <laughs> but yeah, uh, absolutely, uh, spiritual renewal is really important, and uh, spending time out in nature is kind of how I do it. I, I was an environmental reporter when I started doing this. I was writing about militias in the 90s as an environmental backlash story, and it kind of got swept away in the current. Uh, but I was also, I started writing about killer whales back then, too, and stayed with that story. So it's what I do to, yeah, alternate. And that was why I wanted to write a book about humpbacks. <laughs> well, before we get to your slideshow or your mm -hmm. little presentation, I wanted to ask what you think the audience, uh, I mean, when they read this book and they, they, you know, learn about these trends and whatnot, what can they do? What can we do? Well, it, that's the thing. And, and, and of course, I do have some suggestions at the end and talk about how we change our approach. And, and part of it has to do with understanding the dynamic of right-wing extremism Every right-wing extremist I ever knew conceived of themselves as heroic. They see themselves as heroes. And the hero heroism dynamic is really kind of what's killing us because part of, because the left does it too. And when we see ourselves as heroic, the first thing we do is name an enemy. And that, that's how the right, far right works is when they, they go up and start creating enemies even when they aren't there. 
Um, and so I, I think that escaping that dynamic is going to be really key to us. And this is ultimately person, our interpersonal behavior. You know, I don't think we're going to get out of this by with a top-down approach. I think I see all of the um, great social change of the last 10, 15 years has come up from the ground up. You know, gay marriage, marijuana uh, reform, uh, all of the great changes have come up, not come from our leaders. They've come from people changing it from the ground up. And I think if we're going to deal with this phenomenon, we have to do it on the ground, uh, person to person, over our dinner tables and our business dealings and our uh, friend, you know, acquaintances and everything we do. And a lot of it is going to have to do with changing how we deal with this stuff because what we're doing isn't working. Most of all, I, I really want people to come away. I mean, hopefully I just, I think I, people need to understand that democracy, um, liberal democracy, but just democracy in general is under siege right now. Not just in America, but all around the world. And it's being attacked by right-wing authoritarians, primarily uh, the primary state actor is Russia, but it's happening in all these movements going from to Greece and the Golden Dawn. Uh, we've seen them ascendant in uh, rising to the government, levels of government in Hungary and Austria. Um, they're even gaining power in Germany. Um, the, the, the far right is ascendant and these people are fundamentally, absolutely anti-democratic. They do not believe in democracy. They do not believe in equality and th they are hostile to all of those principles and, and it's you know, you, people need to understand that we are, you know, we've had 100 years of a stable liberal democracy and we've kind of taken it for granted. We always assume that we're just going to have these institutions around. The, the respect for the vote, the sense of community that comes from, that from, from a liberal democracy, um, those kinds of things are really under attack right now and we need to stand up. We need, people need to wake up and understand that their way, the, everything that we take for granted now in terms of our stable democratic institutions are under attack and from this movement and also from without. And we need to uh, really be standing up in their defense. I do think that the ultimate defense, as I say, they try to use the institutions of democracy against, to turn it against itself. I think we also need to use the institutions of democracy to defeat them. And that begins with getting out the vote. Get out people to the vote polls. I mean, get out there and, and organize people to run these people out of office. Because the, the only thing they understand is raw political power and... Um, Playing games with them is not going to work. So. Well, on that note, <laughs> um, you're going to do a little presentation. Sure. And then, uh, and then we'll do, uh, take some questions from the audience. What we have to understand is that every generation has its fight. And our fight is this. It's here and now because if the liberals are allowed to start destroying our history, they'll start with Robert E. Lee, they move on to Thomas Jefferson, they move on to George Washington, and soon the entire basis of our society is going to be wrecked. And what's going to be left is their utopian Marxist philosophy, which that they're preparing us for right now. It is fundamentally opposed to the Constitution, it's opposed to our freedoms. I've condemned many different groups, but not all of those people were neo-Nazis, believe me. Not all of those people were white supremacists by any stretch. Those people were also there because they wanted to protest the taking down of a statue, Robert E. Lee. So, excuse me, and you take a look at some of the groups and you see, and you know it if you were honest reporters, which in many cases you're not, but many of those people were there to protest the taking down of the statue of Robert E. Lee. So, this week it's Robert E. Lee. I noticed that Stonewall Jackson's coming down. 
I wonder, is it George Washington next week? And is it Thomas Jefferson the week after? You know, you, all, you really do have to ask yourself, where does it stop? But they were there to protest. Excuse me. You take a look the night before. They were there to protest the taking down of the statue of Robert E. Lee. Infrastructure question. Go ahead. Excuse me. Excuse me. I saw the same pictures as you did. You had people in that group that were there to protest the taking down of, to them, a very, very important statue and the renaming of a park from Robert E. Lee to another name. Well, no, George Washington was a slave owner. Was George Washington a slave owner? So will George Washington now lose his status? Are we going to take down, excuse me, are we going to take down, are we going to take down statues to George Washington? How about Thomas Jefferson? What do you think of Thomas Jefferson? You like him? Okay, good. Are we going to take down the statue? Because he was a major slave owner. Now, are we going to take down his statue? So you know what? It's fine. You're changing history, you're changing culture, and you had people, and I'm not talking about the neo-Nazis and the white nationalists, because they should be condemned totally. But you had many people in that group other than neo-Nazis and white nationalists. Okay. We have to be strong and we have to be courageous. Right now, we have a moment in time, a moment in history, where we have a great president, we have Donald Trump, who is not afraid to stand up for us. <laughs> Donald Trump has donated money as part of the uh, Gulf Coast Relief Program to the home of Jefferson Davis. He's a, he's a good man, Donald Trump. And that's kind of the nub of our problem right there. Um, as you can see, uh, not only does uh, the president mimic um, their rhetoric and, and support them whenever he can. By the way, the crowd that he was talking about um, was the, the, the one that marched on Friday night of Charlottesville, which was actually not a march on the Robert E. Lee statue, that was a march onto the University of Virginia campus. And it was over a thousand white nationalists, all of them were white nationalists, carrying tiki torches. And they were chanting, blood and soil, and you will not replace us. And the next day they were chanting, hail Trump, hail Trump. And as you can see, here, this is a shot I took at the, one of the Portland alt-right rallies. Uh, the, this is a cluster of proud boys, as they call themselves. This is a group of sort of white nationalist uh, enforcers that show up at these rallies and they engage in violent behavior. Um, and they're all wearing Make America Great Again hats or uh, 45 USA hats. Likewise in Berkeley, when I was there, see there's a, there, there are a lot of USA hats, but these two guys in the front, this is uh, the gentleman in the blue shirt is Nathan D'Amigo. He's the founder of Identity Europa, the white supremacist college campus group. And the guy in the plaid shirt's his buddy. Um, and the, the one in the mask was uh, engaging. About two minutes after I took this shot, uh, D'Amigo uh, sucker punched a, uh, a uh, counter protester, an anti fascist, a young woman who was, uh, and that would became a, that video of that particular assault went viral. Um, and the problem is, this is how they see Trump. Trump, they believe, is their leader. Um, this is from a meme that I took off of the Daily Stormer uh, the day that uh, Trump secured the GOP nomination. Um, and they do all kinds of these memes. Uh, here's some more. Uh, this is a pretty interesting one. Those words you see, that script you see at the bottom is an adaptation of the 14 words. Um, more memes from the Daily Stormer. Uh, like I say, they, they like to use humor, whether you find it funny or not, happens to be, has a lot to do with whether you're an empathetic human or not. But um, These are fairly typical Daily Stormer memes. And the problem is that 
this is a Trump, or this is a tweet that Donald Trump made, showing Pepe, the alt-right mascot, as himself, or himself as Pepe. Um, <clears throat> so clearly signal, and all throughout the campaign, the, the, the alt-righters were always seeing stuff like this and going, he loves us, we all, you know. Um, and whenever he would do his, oh, I, well, I disavow the far right, they go, oh, he's just doing what you need to do to remain a viable politician, right? Um, so that was part of their thinking. And then Trump uh, would put up uh, memes like this. This is actually uh, some fake black crime statistics that were created by white nationalists, white supremacists, uh, and Trump retweeted them. Well, of course, we know one of the people who <clears throat> believed in those fake black crime statistics was none other than this young gentleman, Dylan Roof, who killed nine people, nine black people in a Charleston church. And he did it the day after Donald Trump announced his candidacy. So... Um, I'm happy to take any questions, and obviously Knut would be happy to answer questions too. So, thank you. I will give the microphone over to Nick Licata. Thanks. Thank you. And, and please make them questions. Just, uh, no speeches. Right. No, <laughs> just a question. That's nothing personal, Nick. <laughs> <laughs> I've been warned before. Um, the relationship between the Tea Party and the alt-right, it's been documented pretty well that the Tea Party has received tremendous funding from particularly a number of billionaires and things of that sort. Did you, in your research, come across any link between the funding that goes to the Tea Party and the funding that goes to these various alt-right groups? Yeah, the, well, there are these kind of shadowy organizations on the far right, um, such as what's the Council for National Policy, I think they call themselves. Um, we know very little about them, except that they're funded by all these billionaires like the Kochs. And um, they have some real far right wingers and white nationalists sitting on that Council for National Policy. And Steve Bannon's on it too. Um, so, um, yeah, there's, there's this very murky area, and it's very hard to put a finger on it, partly because they, you know, they cover their money up, so you can't really go and find out exactly how many people are getting how much money. Um, but clearly, um, some of these organizations, such as um, uh, Richard Spencer's outfit, and uh, Jared Taylor, uh, Peter Brimlow, uh, these other white nationalist figures, are clearly getting money from uh, some kinds of sugar daddies. Um, we try to track them as much as we can. Some of it is, like you say, it's very clear, you know, the, the, like the Koch brother money. Uh, most of that goes into these, um, these sort of murky, larger organizations like the CNP. Um, but a lot of the, the other people are actually getting funded from, you know, uh, not as well known. Uh, rich people, guys who just got rich in construction or real estate, you know, and just have a lot of money to throw around, so. Hi, my name is Adrian Weller, and I'm with Radical Women, and as we all know, the fascist program for women is not very attractive. So my question is, I've been part of a lot of, of the, uh, at least two large anti-fascist rallies here in New York, in Seattle. And you haven't mentioned, you've mentioned that it has to be from ground up, and I agree, but you haven't mentioned the need to organize really massive numbers, organized, disciplined, and taking them on in numbers, which I think is the only way to push them back. You can't just do it over the dinner table, and I just wonder what you think of that. Yeah, I, I, and I, oh, what can I say? I couldn't cover everything. <laughs> but yeah, there is a need. Um, I, I, you know, I'm, I, I'm not a fan of the anti-fascists uh, as far as, or at least the black bloc group. Um, mainly because they, I think they're hostile. I think they're hostile to journalists, the anti or the black bloc people. And, right, right. But there are, 
and that I was just going to say. So like when I showed up at UW on January 20th, first I was really very happy because the main people that were there were these socialists and leftist groups who were very clearly were there to uh, demonstrate peacefully. And they, that's a very effective way of doing it, especially if you can make it clear that you're shunning them or that, you know, actually my, my all-time favorite uh, anti-fascist demonstration or, or counter-protest took place in 2005 when um, Jim Ram and his National Socialist Movement tried to hold a Nazi rally on the Capitol steps in Olympia. And they were met by a crowd of Olympian, people from Olympia who all came out in clown masks and groucho masks and basically and sat and made fun of these guys all day and basically mooned them. And it was, it was a wonderful thing. For one thing, everybody had a great time, except the Nazis. The Nazis were just humiliated and flustered and red in the face and made the cops very happy because they weren't having to worry about violent, much violence that day. And the press re reported on it very positively. So everything about it changed. I mean, my, my biggest issue with the counter-protests that I've seen so far is that nobody cares about actually persuading anybody, and particularly the public. All they care about is making their demonstration that I punched a Nazi. You know, that's, what I, that's what's happening at these demonstrations. Well, it's what I, I've, I'm covering them, and this is what I've been seeing. So, um, yeah, I, I mean, there, there were really, uh, in Portland, there were really two powerful demonstrations, one by the unions and another by the local leftist groups. And they did a terrific job of counter-demonstrating. This is after the Portland Max stabbing. And, but unfortunately, at the next park over was the Black Bloc folks, and everything went to hell as a result because the whole demonstration turned into um, a series of violent acts. And so those were, you know, and I just don't think that that's particularly, I, I think that that's how you lose. Um, but I do absolutely think that you have to um, show up and show up in numbers to demonstrate to them that they are not uh, the majority. In fact, they really like to think that they're major the majority, but every single one of these rallies that I've been to, they're heavily, heavily, heavily outnumbered. So, Sarah. Hey, Dave. Hi. Hi, old friend. Um, uh, Sarah Robinson here. I'm on the National Board of NARAL, but I'm not here about a women's rights question. I'm here about a use of force question. Um, the two kind of anointed entities in our society that are, are given the use of governmental force are the cops and the, and the military. I was alarmed. I think it was the Washington Post this morning had a story about how the Russian propaganda is now targeting um, our, our men in uniform and our service members, and up to 30% of them ha now have at least some white supremacist leanings. Um, I'm wondering, um, because this is kind of a new wrinkle, it's emerged the cops have always been, you know, had their fascist edge, but, but our, the military has always been, kept a fairly hard line about that, and that seems to be evaporating now. I'm wondering if you could comment and maybe talk about what could be done about that. Actually, it's been an ongoing problem for probably 20 years. Right. But <laughs> um, we've been, the SPLC has certainly been observing um, the large flow of, uh, the large attempts to recruit members of the military um, into these white extremist groups for some time. But um, the FBI in 2008 did a, uh, by the way, the story that uh, Sarah is referring to is a piece that came out just today that showed that, uh, demonstrated that there are, there's this huge uh, segment of the military that something like 40% um, of all um, people who are of color in the military are encountering uh, white nationalism within the ranks and that this white nationalism and even white people are, are encountering it and reporting on it. So, and this is not a new problem. Uh, we saw neo-Nazis starting to 
make incursions into the ranks of the military as early as the late 90s. And um, it became really an issue that the FBI investigated in a report that they published in 2008 uh, that really asset, uh, claimed, you know, pointed out that this is going to be a growing problem. One of the real issues with recruiting members of the military and veterans is that it's what we call the Tim McVeigh syndrome, that those people are 10 times more competent at killing people and using material and guns and bombs and whatever than your ordinary militia schlub is. And this is, we've actually been very lucky with most of our history of domestic terrorism in America and that most of these right-wing extremists are not typically competent. Um, but a guy like Tim McVeigh or Eric Rudolph um, changes that equation considerably because they are competent at those uh, things and so they're, they're really a threat and it's a real cause for concern. Unfortunately, the year after the FBI put out that report, DHS also did a, uh, put out a bulletin warning law enforcement that um, these extremists were gonna be recruiting members of the military and veterans and the right wing media got a hold of it, Fox News and Rush Limbaugh and Michelle Malkin and they turned it into a giant right wing um, cause celeb and forced Janet Napolitano to apologize for the bulletin and uh, they gutted the DHS's uh, section that's devoted to um, uh, researching and monitoring this, this segment down to one person. So, um, the, and so, so that thing, that particular media blow up really, really hurt uh, our efforts to kind of keep proper tabs on right-wing domestic terrorists in this country. So we're finally just getting back, we were starting to get around to it at the end of the Obama years and uh, well, not anymore. So Michael, come on up. Hi, hi Knuth. Um I remember a story back in the mid nineties uh, that shocked me into knowing how uh, this uh, element has is always here, and that was if you can, you probably know this story better than I do. But was when the uh, alt right overcame the old men of the Odd Fellows on Capitol Hill and actually took over that club for a while until uh, the stranger got a story, and uh, and they the national group came in and kicked them out, but that was right here in River City. Yeah, the, in Ballard, right? No, or, right, Capitol Hill. Oh, the Capitol Hill. You know Hill, the Odd Fellows? Oh, uh, yeah, 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 yeah. There's a restaurant right, by that right. name yeah. in that building and a lot of other things, yeah. too. Anyway. Yeah, no, they, they want, want to fly in under the radar, and that's what they've been doing for years and years and years. Um, well, <clears throat> I'll just add to that that in researching... Uh, you know, in the 1930s, we had actual Nazis here in Seattle uh, because there were representatives of the Third Reich stationed on the West Coast, and Seattle had a consulate. We had uh, <clears throat> members of the SS and the Gestapo came through Seattle. They were wined and dined at the Seattle Tennis Club and at various, they went to the opera and whatnot, were shown a good time. Uh, many of the domestic uh, pro-fascist groups spoke at various venues in town, including Odd Fellows, and also what used to be uh, what's now the Egyptian Theater, was the site of a actual major pro-Nazi rally, uh, and that turned into a riot when anti-Nazi demonstrators showed up. So th think about Odd Fellows Hall and those buildings. I can't drive around Capitol Hill now without looking at those buildings and thinking about that history. And one of the other um, incidents from about that era that, that happened up on Capitol Hill, in fact, um, people have forgotten about, was I think it was 91, uh, they had a neo-Nazi gang from Hayden Lake uh, come out here and they were plotting to set off bombs at neighbors at the gay bar. And uh, they, they had, it was a multiple bomb plan. They were gonna kill probably 100 people, or you know, several hundred people and because um, they were first going to set off a bomb on the dance floor and then have everybody scatter for the 
the exits, and then they're going to have bombs going off in the exits. Wow. And uh, and fortunately, the FBI got wind of that and busted them, and uh, that never happened. But then, of course, just a few years ago, neighbors got firebombed again by this time a Muslim extremist. <laughs> but well, it was not. You'd see on Capitol Hill at night, 11, 12 at night, these pickup trucks full of these guys with their dark glasses, yeah. and crew cuts, and, these, and their girlfriends with blindingly blonde hair. I mean, uh, it was incredible. <laughs> Thank well, you so much. Well, yeah, and one of the things that's been going on on Capitol Hill for years that the neighborhoods tried to deal with, but city fathers have just done nothing about is that that we constantly get these guys from out of town, from the exurbs, Monroe or wherever, Kitsap County or places, you know, the, the rednecks that hate gays and they come into town to bash some gays yeah. and they always go up to Capitol Hill. And so the, that, that goes on with pretty regular frequency and there isn't a lot done about it. Yeah. So. Hey, thanks a lot for that. You bet, Mike. Hey, thanks for your time. Um, I'm wondering if you can maybe speak to uh, the pathology. The New Yorker just ran an article recently about somebody who had grown up in an area that was a bit more liberal-minded and then eventually became a mouthpiece for some of these uh, white supremacist movements. And I'm wondering if you, may, you, you can maybe speak to the pathology that is employed to, excuse me, to um, maybe coerce some of these more disillusioned young men into adopting these extremist ideologies and then becoming uh, sort of bastions for uh, support in this movement? Sure. Well, they, they use a variety of different uh, recruitment techniques. Uh, they're, they're trying to recruit people from... Uh, one of the things about the alt-right is it's actually got a lot of different segments. And that, one of its origin points was the Gamergate controversy. Uh, which was a thing involving video gamers, but it was it was fundamentally this really deeply misogynist uh, controversy in the gaming world, where these misogynists started organizing and harassing these feminist gamers, and um, it was became this big wellspring for white nationalism because white nationalists are also devotedly anti-feminist and. Um, they, it was one of their sort of common grounds. And so at these chat room places like 4chan and Reddit and these internet forums where they can all sit around and talk, um, these became the meeting grounds for these various disparate components of aggrieved white males who really formed the, the alt-right movement. And that was, that's how it happened. Um, so, yeah. <laughs> and I think this will be our last question. Sorry. Hello. I've, I've seen you at some of the rallies, so. Yes, yes. you have. Yeah. It's actually a pleasure to meet you again. You and yeah. I actually met the first time at UW. Yeah. So it's a pleasure to see you again. Yeah. Uh, I don't know if you actually remember, I spoke at the August rally. I did. Yes. Yeah, you, were, you spoke in Vancouver, right? Uh, I've spoken all up and down the West Coast. I've yeah, spoken yeah, in yeah, Seattle, yeah. Portland, as well as recently Berkeley during Milo's Free Speech Week. Right. My name is Cobb Broussard. It's right. a pleasure to meet you. I'm, I'm familiar with you. Go yes. ahead. So uh, I had a genuine question. One, uh, since I'm going to be the last speaker more than likely, I would like to raise one... We don't have a lot of time, so try and keep That's fine. Uh, first real quick question. It'll take all of 10 seconds. Uh, when Trump had addressed the issue of Thomas Jefferson and George Washington, the statues being taken down next, that had, that had come up in your video. Yeah. On, uh, the, on the 17th of August. It's yeah. not gonna, it ain't going to happen. Yeah. On the 17th of August, yeah. Angela Ray, the former executive director of the Congressional Black Caucus, actually called for the removal of the Jefferson Monument. And who is now, she? She is the former director of the Executive Congressional Black Caucus, who she, was recently on she, CNN she, and called she, for she, it. She has no pull. Look, there, the, there's peop, there are people on the French who go around and talk about it, but if you think there's any actual movement to remove, especially the Jefferson Monument in D.C. Jefferson Memorial, yes. The Jefferson Memorial, the, 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 it, it, it ain't happening. All right. Now, now and, the, and I have a real question, though. I do have a real question. Yeah, yeah, go ahead and let him ask okay. one more. So yeah. with the rise of identity politics, we've also seen a large grouping of people who are multicultural, including Joey Gibson from Patriot Prayer, of which you've written about yep. before in the SPLC. Uh, you've seen that these, these rise of these multicultural groups who speak avidly 
of the freedom of speech and have invited over at the Moore rally over in Washington, D.C., have invited Black Lives Matter as well as recent activists here in Seattle and Vancouver up to the stage personally to encourage them to have the freedom of speech just the same as anybody else. Don't you, doesn't that point to the fundamental idea that the freedom of speech is at the core of this movement and the fringe, the alt-right, are rather the smaller groups that really have nothing to do with the foundational principle of preservation of freedom of speech? Actually, I, no, I, I really think that they're pretty cynically using, Joey is very cynically using free speech, I think, as a, as a crutch for what he's really trying to do is go out there and make people on the left look bad. That's, that's what he's been doing from the start. He goes out there when he was in Olympia. He tried to, he walked right into the middle of the crowd and basically invited them to punch him. They didn't punch him, they pepper sprayed him instead. They but, punched him and, 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 and just 10 minutes before that, uh, a guy from the far, one of the anti fascists had been caught on the other side with the alt right folks and he got the crap beaten out of him and shoved over to the cops. So you tell me that they're in favor of his free speech, but I don't see it happen. The only time I've seen it happen was in Seattle when Joey actually invited all kinds of people up there to speak. But, he had, but when he was in Vancouver, there weren't any left-wingers that came up to speak. There weren't any, and, and, you know, and he wears a Hillary for president shirt, but he says, I'm tolerant of liberals. Come on. You, you know, this, this is just, it's very... Cynical, and, and you need to understand that you're being used. So, thanks. thank you. And if you have a final thought or anything you want to add at the end, nah. Okay. Right, thank well, you thank you all so much um, for being here.